Hello, welcome everybody to the JR Book Club. So tonight we're going to be talking about a remarkable new book by Riva Lehrer called Golem Girl, which looks at issues of gender, disability, um, many, many different issues around identity, but perhaps above all, the complexities and joy of being a human being. And to discuss that tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Reva, who's with us from Chicago, where it's still daytime, and uh, Julia Pascal, who's with us in London. So hello to both of you and hello to, to our audience. So Reva Lehrer is an artist, writer, and curator. Her work focuses on issues of physical identity and the socially challenged body. She's best known for representations of people with impairments and for those whose sexuality or gender identity have long been stigmatized. She's a faculty member of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and is also an instructor in medical humanities at Northwestern University. Julia Pascal is a playwright, theater director, and scholar. She was the first woman director at the National Theatre in London, and her plays include the Holocaust Trilogy, the Yiddish Queen Lear, Woman in the Moon, Honeypot, and Crossing Jerusalem, and her work's been performed throughout the world. So I'm delighted to welcome you both tonight, and uh, also to ask our audience you two can join in with the conversation. First of all, Julia will be discussing the book with Reva, but then I'd like to invite you to ask questions. Please use the chat function on your Zoom platform, and you can put the questions you want to Reva. And in the meantime, please keep yourself on mute as it makes everything go a bit smoother. So I'm gonna hand over to Julia to chair our meeting tonight. Well, I'm honored to be here to interview Reva, and uh, thank you for asking me, Rebecca. I first came across this wonderful book when Rebecca asked me to review it for Jewish Renaissance, and I have to say it's the best book I've read in years for many, many reasons. I won't go into it because I don't want to give a review, and I want Reva to talk. But just primarily to kick off, I'm a wordsmith. Uh, I write, I can't paint, and I was knocked out that Reva is as talented a writer as she is an artist. And so the book contains both, and I recommend it. It's very, very stimulating. I'd like to start by asking Reva to go straight in and to read the first chapter, pages one to nine. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is uh, an honor, and thank you for tearing yourself away from Megan and Harry, uh, who is filling the airwaves here this week. Um, my reading glasses are, ah, here they are. So uh, just to set this up a little bit, this is chapter one of the book. Um, the first few chapters, because they're not my actual memories, um, they're based on stories that my mother told me. So um, the first four chapters are headed Carol's story. Carol's story, it's alive. She told me my story when she was proud of me. Look how you turned out. She told me my story when I annoyed her so much that she folded her arms across her breasts and tilted her eyebrows at me like notched arrows. Have you forgotten what I went through you, for you? She told me my story when we had company. Look how she turned out. She told me my story to she told my story to every new doctor and nurse who crossed our path. My mother's stories run through my head like a piece of silver nitrate film. April, 1958. So I have to kind of arrange the book here a bit. Carol froze, hands in the air, caught in the act of tugging her blouse over her head. Not this, not again. She'd been so careful. Months on bed rest, moving through the apartment like an overfull balloon, afraid to so much as bump the furniture in case it pricked her skin and spilled her contents onto the floor. They were spilling now. Hot liquid spiraled down her legs. She shuffled into the bathroom and waited for the expected release. 
Sorry, I don't think I can use my book rack. Waited for the expected release of mangled tissue for another baby that could have been to slide out to slide out of her on a torrent of red. She looked down at the floor and, oh God, it wasn't blood. She was standing in a puddle of viscous pink water. Invisible hands twisted her like wet laundry. What a strange thing it is when pain means hope. Jerry heard her shriek and ran through the bedroom, slid into the bathroom. She yelled, honey, I'm in labor. And he shouted, where is the suitcase? What do I pack? The suitcase that would have been packed and ready to go if things had been happening according to schedule. This day was precisely one month before the due date she'd been given in the obstetrician's office. Jerry drove like he'd never heard of traffic laws. Carol sat doubled over on every towel they owned. It was all so unfair. She had the kind of sturdy, wide-hipped, large-breasted body celebrated in fertility sculptures since the dawn of time. At 24, she looked able to birth a clan, a tribe, a city-state, while striding through the fields with arms loaded with harvest. Instead, there had been three miscarriages in less than two years, followed by eight months of paranoid restraint. Jerry thought, if, that's, if this is all there is, just us, forever, Dainu. It's not that he didn't want children, he did, but he'd almost given up on family life at all. Jerry had married late at the age of 31, eight years after coming home from the army. He'd been with the 102nd Infantry Division, the Fighting Ozarks, when they landed at Cherbourg in September 1944. The 102nd fought their way across Belgium until reaching Aachen, which was where Jerry's foxhole ran out of ammunition. Something possessed him to run across fields of fire in search of resupply. Miraculously, he made it back unscathed and stayed that way until the last, next to last day of his enlistment. The fleeing German army lobbed mortar shells behind them as they retreated. One blew up and slammed shrapnel into Jerry's face. The army traded a purple heart and a bronze star for the shattered jaw and the teeth left behind on the battlefield. Six months in a hospital in England, then home to Cincinnati with a subtly new face and the determination to squeeze the GI Bill for all it was worth. He racked up a CPA degree and dated a little but being shot in the face doesn't leave a fellow feeling attractive. His sister Ruth just happened to have this friend, a sparkling friend who flirted away Jerry's shyness. And then, and then he was married to a knockout nine years his junior. In silent black and white footage of their wedding, Jerry is levitating while Carol's hands fly and flutter like the spread wings of birds. But then Carol started losing babies and sorrow piled up behind her eyes. I'm just going to show you a picture of my parents. This book is full of my art, but it's also full of family photographs. Let's see, is this on camera? Is this on? I'm going to assume this is on camera. So those are my parents on the day that they were wed. Jerry nearly drove up on the sidewalk in his haste to reach the, emer the emergency room. The man was usually a bundle of worried ticks, gasps, and pronouncements, but he tried crooning, don't worry, honey, don't worry, don't worry. Silently, he told the baby, you show up now, kid, or I'm coming in to get you. As his wife's gurney disappeared behind the swinging OR doors. Labor is labor, hours of pain, but it was a pain Carol welcomed because every other pregnancy so far had ended with a faster agony and no one to hold. At 6.04 in the morning, the baby was born. Then all was confusion. Doctors and nurses ran around the room, calling for equipment as the baby screamed in a way that surpassed the normal trauma of air and bright light. Carol demanded to see the baby, but they'd taken it to a far table. The baby, boy, girl? No one could tell. Carol was told that the lower half of its body was encased in adhesions. 
the amnion, the inner layer of the placental wall, had adhered to the baby's skin and formed swaths like a mummy's bandages. These had affixed the baby to Carol's uterus as if her body was trying to keep the child inside the maternal fortress as if preparing dressings for the surgeries that lay ahead, as if knowing that mother and child would never be much good at separation. A nurse stepped away and there it was, her genderless shrieking infant, an infant with a grotesque red sack protruding from, protruding from its back. Then Carol knew exactly what the obstetrician was about to say. Her baby had spina bifida. Carol had seen these children for years. Up until this bed rest pregnancy, she'd been a medical researcher at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where she'd worked for Josef Dworkini, an Austrian physician who had, who had established the field of teratology in America. Teratology, from the Greek teratos, or monster, is the medical term for the study of birth defects. Workity revolutionized the medical understanding of the origin of impairments. Among these, spina bifida was one of the most common and the most commonly fatal. In 1958, no one knew what caused spina bifida, only that it fell within the category of congenital conditions known as neural tube defects. The words spina bifida mean split spine. When you feed it, sorry, yeah, lots of words. Okay, lips. When a fetus is in utero, the bones and casings around the spinal cord are supposed to fuse and create a tube that houses and protects the spinal cord. But if these parts fail to fuse, they leave an open fissure, a lesion, somewhere along the length of the spine, anywhere from the skull to the sacrum, a literal hole in, in the body. As a consequence, any pathogen entering that hole has access to the brain. Spina bifida babies are born open to the world. There are different severities of the condition. The mildest case, spina bifida occulta, are those in which the spine remains closed with minor malformations of one and more vertebrae. Forgive me, people. I get asked all the time, what is spina bifida? So I thought in the beginning of the book, I would just get it out of the way. There's another chapter that goes in a little more deeply, but hang in there with me. We're almost back at story. But to go back, uh, Spina bifida occulta are those in which the spine remains closed with minor malformation of one or more vertebrae. This causes little or no injury. Often from the outside, Carol could scarcely tell that anything was wrong with these children. And by the way, I make the point in the book a little bit later how absolutely eerily bizarre it was that my mother was working for one of the only doctors who would have gotten her in front of multiply disabled children, including those with spina bifida. Most women with babies like me would have had absolutely no idea what it meant, what, any, what it was, what it meant, um, how to think about it. My mother was in a very unusual and uh, unimaginably coincidental position. Let's see. I think I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, so it makes the point that uh, that she knew what spina bifida was because she'd worked with Dr. Warkany. Um, I will say uh, the prevailing medical opinion was that surgeons should leave these children alone until they reach the age of two. If they survived that long, then they were strong enough for treatment. Otherwise, they were a waste of medical resources. Parents were advised to cherish their babies for the short time that they'd have them. Yosef Workany disagreed with this ethic. Carol had never imagined her own child on Workany's examination table. The baby actually had a decent weight for a preemie, so an ambulance took it directly across Bernard Avenue to Ch Cincinnati Children's Hospital. 
Carol prayed for a surgeon who wouldn't wait until that impossible second birthday. And indeed they were in luck. Children's had just hired a young Harvard trained surgeon named Lester Martin. He was soap opera handsome. He really was, my God, what a doll. <laughs> but more to the point, freshly trained in the latest techniques to close the spina bifida lesion, highly unusual. There's a description of the surgery that was performed. All right, Carol and Jerry sat in the waiting room, hands gripped in a sailor's knot of fingers. They'd picked out names, but what does one call a new person whose genitals are hidden in a shroud? A contingent of Lehrers and Horwitzes had filled the waiting room by the time the surgical resident stepped out of the OR and said, your daughter is hanging in there. So far, so good. It seemed that Dr. Martin had removed enough adhesions to reveal her sex. Jerry cleared his throat. We're naming her Riva Beth Joan, Rivka Braniochevit. As always, English name first, then Hebrew name. They were naming the baby after her great-grandmother, Riva Brani Newmark, and great-grandfather, Yosef Lehrer. Ashkenazi families pull their children's name from the afterlife. Children begin life as the phantoms of people that they will never meet. Everyone in the room understood why she'd been given so many names. In Jewish folklore, the angel of death is rather stupid. He wanders the world with his clipboard and paperwork, seeking his victims by name. If a baby is born with an illness, you give it multiple names. This confuses the angel who scratches his flaming skin and says, who is this, Riva, Rina? I don't know. Guess I'll come back later. Lucky for, lucky for all concerned, even God can't get good help. Carol thought of her colleagues at Children's. She could have used their support now. She might be surrounded by family, but the truth was none of them understood what a diagnosis of spina bifida really meant. She alone had no comforting ignorance to hide behind as she accepted being this child's mother. My mother for whom on that day, life itself was all that mattered. Thanks. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Julia, take it away. And unmute Julia. I wanted Riva to read the first chapter for many reasons, and I think you can see why. What I found most stunning was the multi-layered. It's incredibly uh, charismatic, many-storied, uh, funny, tragic human story. That's a cliche human story. Of course, it's a human story. But what I liked was, for example, the father uh, D-Day landings being shot, the, 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 the unattractive face, the woman who falls for him, the whole backstory, it, it's extremely cinematic. Um, I felt the moments like I was reading a film script. Um, the way that Reva pulls us into the whole medical story, but in, in a way that's really acceptable and really accessible and really easy, it, it's just intriguing. I really didn't know what spina bifida was. And I, Riva, you said hang in with me there, but in a way, coming from you and the way you put it, it it's very important to know, and, and it's done delicately, but incredibly poetically. <laughs> I'm, just saying, uh, I'm full of admiration because of the skills, and I wanted to ask you the structure. The structure is very complex. You, you're in the third person, uh, you're in the past, you're in the present, you're in the Greek mythological world, you're in the Ashkenazi Jewish world, you're in Kabbalah, um, you're in American history, you're in European history. You've got an enormous amount of areas that you're playing with simultaneously. It's a very skillful piece of writing. I'm much in admiration of it. And I wanted to ask you, how did you get to the idea of structure? Well, I knew that some of my story, like I said, I. I rewrote the book multiple times. So this is this version was version number five. And 
there were earlier versions that were experimental where I was trying to tell my story as if as if I could have been conscious of it. And that felt so wrong and inappropriate and fake. And then I wrote ones where my mother is actually telling it as a story, but that also really didn't work for a variety of reasons that will make sense if you read the book. Um, so it had to be a little bit meta. It had to be me telling her story. So I was thinking, well, what sh what sh what would she have known? And um, and then there were pieces that I only found out after I had started to write. So one of the most remarkable, really, that led to the real writing of the book was that I had grown up thinking that my mother was medical secretary, and I knew she'd worked for work and he, but I wasn't all that clear on who he was or what she'd done for him. And I was home in Cincinnati uh, interviewing people in 2014, I think, in my family about my mom's story because she died quite a long time ago. And my uncle, her oldest brother, when I said, oh, mom was a secretary for work. And he said, no, she wasn't. And I went, what do you mean? He said, she was a medical researcher. And I just, I mean, my eyes fell out, my tongue sort of rolled off down the hallway. It was just like, what? <laughs> and so I started thinking about what that would have meant, that she would have been much more intimately involved, I assume, in interviewing children, being in the room. Um, and it turned out later, I got another piece of information one of the main causes of spina bifida is that the mother either doesn't get enough folic acid in her diet or is unable. I'm sure a lot of you, the women out there who have had children have been given folic acid uh, supplements. And it turned out that what she was most involved in was the effect of vitamins and supplements on birth defects. And, you know, she would not have had no idea at the time that folic acid would have done anything. This was the beginning of the experimental years. So the sort of story within story just kind of led to the thinking of story within story. Um, but the whole book, the, the structure of the book is very complicated overall. So I think that let me get away with certain sort of embedding tales inside tales. Yes, it gives you freedom, doesn't it, and, and free association. What, what you just talked about is this kind of split in your mother's persona. The fact that you thought she was a secretary, does that mean that she never talked about her real work? I, it's, it's, I have racked my brain. Mm -hmm. I knew she talked about working as a, as a boss, that he was incredibly sweet. And um, so his story, by the way, which, which is in the book, but I'll since there's a bunch of Jews out there, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about who he was. In my understanding, he was a young Austrian physician, I think Austrian, who was a brilliant, brilliant young doctor and had gotten a fellowship to come to uh, Cincinnati to study in the very, very earliest of genetic, um, it was just the, the beginning of genetic research and they were doing breakthrough research in Cincinnati on the genetics of, uh, of birth defects. It's, it's not really a term I particularly like. I, I don't like the word defect. I usually use anomaly or variation, but for the sake of the time period, I'll use birth defect. Um, and so he's in Cincinnati when Hitler comes to power and he can't go back because he's a Jew from I think Austria, I don't think he was Hungarian, but I think he was Austrian. And so he's stuck in Cincinnati for what, it, I mean, wherever he was from, he couldn't go back to Europe. And so uh, before him, the ideas of what caused birth anomalies were, a lot of it was buried in superstition and ignorance. And usually the mother was blamed, something the mother did. And so, the fact that mom would have been there working for him, not only, not only is this about children, but it's also about mothers and about lifting away the guilt from mothers about whether or not 
whatever their child is born with was somehow their fault, which it rarely, rarely is. So, you know, he was he was also an artist, by the way. You can look him up, Yosef Workeny's etchings. He did beautiful etchings. He had, he did one of a since a big uh, sort of Romanesque synagogue that was uh, down in downtown Cincinnati. He gave that to them for their wedding gift. My brother has that. Because you say she was an artist at home. Just to go back to the split in your mother. That's the line I just lifted up today. And you said she was, she was a medical expert at work, but she was an artist at home. And your whole story, I'm just moving towards your childhood. There's amazing material about you and the dolls and the beginning of your own artistic uh, critique. I think they're quite, it's quite a critical uh, young child's analysis of, of dolls. Could you talk a little bit about that? It, did we pick that out to read? About dolls? Yes, it's on 15. Um, you want to read or just talk about it? Up to you, your choice. I... Okay, why don't you just read it? It's, a, it's very fascinating. Um, well, a little bit of background. My mom, my mother's family, many of them are very uh, artistically gifted. Some of them did something with it. Some of them didn't. My uncle Barry was an incredible photographer. My uncle Lester actually went to the School of the Art Institute here in Chicago. And when my mother wanted to do that, they forbade her and made her go to pharmacy school, which she hated and managed to get out of by <laughs> arranging a lab accident and blinding herself for six months, which is not funny, but that gives you some idea of the desperation. Her eyes healed, but uh, she could. She just desperately wanted out of there. Um, her parents were pharmacists, and they wanted her to take over the drugstore, and that wasn't going to work for her. But mom wanted to be a fashion designer, so when I was growing up, um, and all through her life, she made her own clothing. Early on, she made my clothing. She made clothing for my dolls. Um, there's a lot I don't want to spoil about that, but I grew up, also she, she loved beautiful objects. There was sort of beauty all over our house. Um, we didn't, we were sort of in terms of income, lower, lower middle class, but her aesthetic was more artistic than about um, uh, one's class rating. Like the things we had were not about whether they were expensive. They were about whether they were beautiful. So um, the dolls thing, uh, I guess I'll just read because it's it's a little hard to explain without reading it. And it also, it's about Jews. Again, it's, it's a very Jewy book. This is the, ins <laughs> this is the inside cover. Uh, this is... Those of you pining to run out and buy it, that is the outside cover. And it's uh, published by Virago in England. And bless them, they are wonderful. I, I am sure you all know Virago. They are such a force for good. And while I'm trying to find, uh, do you have the page there by any chance? 56. 56. Really? 56. <laughs> Okay, so this, uh, I'm, I think, 10 uh, here, 10 years old. And um, the piece right before this is about my mom making a dress for the holidays. And my mother was a very big woman. I'm a very small woman because partly, mostly because of the spina bifida, but my mom was tall and she was a big woman. And this is the 60s, and I'm sure that some of you remember trying to buy clothing if you were an unusual size in the 60s. They wanted you to suffer. So she, she made her own clothes, and she would have, anyway, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, but the struggle to feel beautiful when you are different is something I saw her go through, and I've certainly gone through my whole life. Mom said, the, 
Mom set the menorah on the table and draped her hair with a cloth. She lit the first night candle with the shamus candle, and we prayed. Fitzivanu lahalik ner shel Hanukkah, amen. Rivulets of pastel wax crept down the arms of the menorah. We passed around the browned kugel, the amber bowls of matzo ball soup, the brisket, the tzimis, an edible museum of Jewish culture. The finale was, I cannot talk today. The finale was Carol Sue Lair's famous homemade strudel. When dessert was reduced to microscopic flakes, our parents took pity and said, okay, kids, Whereupon we bolted to the living room and clawed at the gift wrap like uncaged Vildachayas. There's a lot of Yiddish in the book. Yes. <laughs> a little gift to you. The small packages were for the first night. Hefty eighth night gifts waited at the far end of the couch. I already knew what was inside my big package. For years, I'd been given the same two feet by one foot box. I was five when I got my first Chatty Cathy doll. She'd seemed so big that she could have been my unbending sister, blonde and blue as apple pie. Kathy could talk if I pulled a cord out of the back of her neck. Will you play with me? Let's change my dress. I'm hungry. I hurt myself. I love you. Tell me a story. Kathy sounded like a child gargling hot glue. Like me, Kathy went away for repair, not to children's, but to the doll hospital downtown. Kathy's voice box was actually a tiny record player mounted inside her chest, easily broken during even mildly vigorous play. The girl had cardiac issues, hence the succession of new chatties. I demanded to be, seen, to be taken to see the doll hospital I was so disappointed that it was just a tiny, tiny storefront on Elm Street with hundreds of dolls wedged inside its dusty cases. When I was little, mom had sewn us matching outfits, mommy dress, Reva dress, Kathy dress, cut from the same bolt of cloth. Now that I was 10, mom and grandma had begun buying me A-line shifts that hid my spine. I didn't feel safe. I just felt sad. My dolls had stopped being my companions and become excuses to make elaborate doll houses instead. Castles made of appliance cartons with Morton salt turrets and corduroy carpeting cut from the scraps of my trousers. I was better at loving those houses than loving my perfect pink dolls. Of course. So you had questions yeah, about the doll, the doll in our society, the 60s, uh, women as dolls, your dolls, but this doll with the voice. It's very complex. I don't think there's anything about it. I found it touching. Um, the, the dolls, in a way, they seemed almost symbolic, hidden, hidden behind a storefront, dusty. Uh, the people one didn't want to see because they're broken has all sorts of resonances, I think, within the whole book. But I, it brings me to the question of the title of the book, because the other side of the dolls is the golem, perhaps. And, and why did you call it Golem Girl? Well, the theme of dolls and figures um, runs through the book. I'm a portrait artist. That's really what I do. I'm trying to write a new book, but this is my first book and may, God knows, be my only book. I hope not, but we'll see. But I'm a portrait artist. And I, as I write in the book, when I, I spent the first two years in the hospital without coming home. And the relationship there is that in the hospital, you, you don't have any conception of the world except maybe on TV and whatever you can see from your window. So absolutely everything is people, you know, trying to figure out what people mean, how to read their faces, their voices, when they're telling you the truth, what you have to prepare yourself for. Um, so I think for me, what, what happened is that I really became obsessed with the human 
uh, the embodied human, um, particularly reading faces. And so the, for me, dolls were, um, you know, I had a big collection of Barbies. There was a way in which I disassociated myself. Like when I would hear that little girls are supposed to model themselves after their dolls. The first time I heard that I was shocked. It was like, no, they were objects that you had, you made stories about, but I did, I never thought I was supposed to model myself on them because that was impossible. I was the farthest thing from a Barbie you could get, except for, you know, a Volkswagen or something. And so, you know, if, if I had seen myself in my chatty Kathy, that began to fade. I don't, chatty Kathy was a pretty big doll. And like I said, she had a voice box. And when I was little, I was really little. I'm only four foot nine now. And I was always a small child. So when I first got this big doll, you know, she wasn't that much smaller than me. But as my body changed and the dolls stayed the size that they were and the sort of perfect selves that they were, they started, I think, very faintly to feel like a rebuke. So the only thing I could do with them was make up stories that were not about me, that were about, uh, I mean, really, they, they became... I was much more interested in making clothes for them and making furniture and making houses and making little cars and whatever else it could come up with than anything the dolls were particularly doing other than sitting around in those houses and wearing the clothes. Um, but later, I, I, I guess we'll talk about this later, but I started, my work is entirely about the human face and body and the history of them in portraiture and how to incorporate um, variants, striking variants in the history of portraiture. So there's, for me, there's a total through line of the human figure as a question. And how does that relate to the goal, the, the idea of the golem? The, the, yeah, the golem, the sorry. Story. So the identity. Well, so does everybody, know the golem story i am looking at the chat number if you don't know the golem story write no because otherwise i don't want to bore everybody by retelling it just 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 write no i'm watching the number and right now it's still five so maybe you all do know the story of the golem okay there's a no okay <laughs> uh so it's golem not golem in Yiddish, it's something like goylem. The story begins, or the idea of the goylem, uh, or the golmi, which is the first word in Hebrew used for this, uh, is in Genesis, where Adam is made out of clay, and he's called golmi, which means shapeless. And so he's the first being built out of um, an inert material, and then magically brought to life, uh, in this case, by the word of God. And then he makes Eve, who's sort of a second generation, you know, person 2.0, which is why we're better. Um, but through all, just about all civilizations and all literatures, the theme of the magically uh, magically built and magically um, animated being uh, exists. And in many cases, it's built because there's trouble. Um, there, a society's in trouble, a family's in trouble. Um, often it's a society and someone decides to build a protector or some kind of robot or some kind of being that's gonna uh, use magic to change the situation. But in those stories, um, what happens is that the creature, and in this case, the golem. So the golem, the most famous story is from 16th century Prague, where a rabbi who was a real rabbi, Rabbi Judah ben Betzalel, who was in Prague, was the legend went that when there was going to be a pogrom of the Jews of Prague, 
that he caught wind of this because he was the chief rabbi and that he prayed for an answer. And God told him to go to the Vlatva River and dig around in the mud and make a man. And he gave him the secret. He gave him a secret word of a uh, secret name of God. And he wrote it on a parchment and put it in the monster's mouth. And then he wrote the word emet, um, truth, on the forehead of the, of the creature. And it rose up and the rabbi told it to go off and find the conspirators. And in, there's a lot of versions of this. Um, in the one that I chose, it's one where he, um, the monster kid, uh, uh, arrests them takes them and puts them in the jail in the city of Prague because of course the Jews were in a were in the ghetto um, or in their their own section of Prague. And so the the administrators of Prague would, you know, the sheriff or the head of the gendarmes, I don't know what they would have been called, would get up in the morning and their jail would be full of these guys who were planning the pogrom and there were more and more and more. And finally, the mayor or the, I, I'm so blanking on the names of the various magistrates, but the magistrate came to the rabbi and said, the program is over, you're safe. But in this happening, the monster is out in the world. And every time it comes back, it's bigger. And it's described as, as getting out of control. And the way I interpret that is that the monster, the golem, is in count experiencing itself in the world. It's getting experiences. It's starting to know itself and it's starting to have its own desires and its own thoughts about what the world is and how it wants to be in it. And this is unacceptable because each time it gets more of this, it's less under the rabbi's control. So finally, when the rabbi hears that the Jews are safe, he tricks the golem into bending over. And the golem is now enormous because like I said, every time it comes back, it's grown. So it bends over and the rabbi goes like this and wipes the aleph off of uh, emet. And then you have just met, you know, dead or, or death. And the golem falls down in a heap of mud. But the, the thankful Jews go and gather up all of the, the dust and take it to the genitza of the synagogue where the rumor is it resides to this day. And the reason I called myself a golem girl is three main reasons. Um, one is that I've had a lot of surgery and I've always felt like a constructed being, that I am, I am made as much as I am born, absolutely. That I was made for a purpose, not my own, because when I was in the 1950s and the 60s, there were no disability rights. There was no, there were no role models. Um, I was explicitly told I would never have a relationship or a career or move away from home. And the expectation was that I would live with my parents always. Um, and the thing that the golem does eventually is that it protects its people. And my role in the world has become something where I'm not exactly protecting my people. I wouldn't say that, but I'm trying to explain and change ideas about who we are. And that's both disabled people and queer people and people who are just identify as different and suffer for it. There's a, a sense of the golem being a warrior to save his people within the original, which in a way I found your book fascinating in terms of here is someone you would never say is a warrior on, on a superficial look, but actually once you read the book and get to know you, you are a warrior. It's a, I know it's International Women's Day and I'm thinking about such things. Who are the women we admire? Who are the warrior women we, we look up to? And uh, the golem as, as a warrior, I found a rather interesting concept that I hadn't thought about till I read your book. I don't know if that has any resonance for you or whether you see yourself that way. Uh, yeah, in some ways. I mean, I, I'm so fascinated by the way that the idea of the golem goes all the way through our culture. I, you know, 
Mr. Data and the Borg and Pinocchio. And, you know, there are just so many magical creatures who step in when there's a problem or a lack and what happens when they do that. But also, <clears throat> uh, I'm extremely interested in monster theory. There's, a, a, there's an academic um, area called monsterology or monster theory. And it also intersects with the story of the golem and what the role of monsters in culture is extremely important and interesting um, and why we need them and why we uh, invent them. You, you talked earlier about punishment, the punishment of being different from the so-called norm. And in the book, I'm looking at page 62, you talk about a school which is both hor horrible, but also very funny. I, I keep coming back to the humor in the book. There's a sense of irony and wit that's very strong. I wonder if you'd mind just reading, it's a very short piece. Um, it's chapter 12, Google Gobble. And oh. uh, that's all right. Mm. I, yes, um, I'm not going to try and replicate the accent of the person <laughs> um, who was doing this for a lot of reasons. So I'm going to read it a little bit straighter than it actually happened. I also, I need to cough for a moment for just, just a second. I'm going to mute myself. Aging, what a concept. I'm sorry, will you tell me again the page number? 62 to 65. And if you've done a couple exercises it, this morning, I, I had the chance to record my audiobook. I thought they were insane when they asked me to do it. I'm like, actors, don't you have actors? <laughs> but for six weeks, I'm in the studio trying to read my life. And um, it did something interesting in my voice. It seems to have like affected my vocal cords. <clears throat> All right, here we go. I'm going to back away from the microphone for a second. Retards! 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 Sometimes, six or seven kids stood at the corner where we'd stop at the red light. Other days, there would be teenagers or even a single vicious adult. There was no lack of people eager to scream, retard, at the top of their lungs. Our bus, okay, I'm sorry, uh, we didn't set this up. I went to a special school, so-called. It was uh, called Condon School, and it was a school entirely for disabled children. And I loved it, and I hated it, and I write a lot about it in the book, and it's full of very rare archival photographs of this school. Um, the history of the school is completely fascinating. So to catch us up, Condon School. Our bus was painted with Condon School in big block letters, so we were always 100% visible as we made the rounds. Certain blocks were best traveled with our heads ducked below the window line. The projectiles might be rocks or water balloons or eggs. The splattering of yellow yolks on a yellow bus leaves its booboed and swollen, a plague bus carrying an infectious cargo. If I was stupid enough to tell anyone where I went to school, they'd look puzzled and say, but you don't seem, uh... the R word wasn't forbidden. Strangers just didn't seem to know how to rate my intelligence. Uh, I'm gonna skip bits. Um, I talk about when we would go out on field trips um, and how we would be completely stared at the minute we got off the bus. For me, the worst was our yearly trip to the Shrine Circus. The Shriners were a lodge of Freemasons that funded the Shriners hospitals. I don't know if you guys have that in England. You must have things like that. Um, places devoted to the treatment of sick or disabled children. Condon kids were always seated at ringside level. So we would get all the special attention that special needs kids deserved. I'd press myself backwards as the clowns came around and zanied themselves right in our faces. 
As the spotlight swept over our heads, I felt as if it was picking out the visiting sideshow for the entire audience to enjoy. Usually once I got home, I'm sorry, once, once I got to school, I could relax. Fifth grade was uncommonly homey under the auspices of Mrs. Bockledge, a sheltering hen of a teacher. But one day Mrs. Bockledge was nowhere to be seen. An unfamiliar woman stood at the blackboard. She was thin and dry as a rawhide shoe, <laughs> rawhide shoe, not shoe, sorry, draped in a flowered dress that hung loosely from her bones. Her neck stuck out of her Peter Pan collar like a dandelion in a Dixie cup. She spoke loudly and slowly. Mrs. Bockledge is out sick. Take your seats. Hurry up, y'all. My name is Miss Boyd. Obediently, we settled in, our desktops rising and falling with a bang as we fished out our textbooks. Miss Boyd interrupted with, nah, nah, no books right now. We got something else to do this morning. All you children get ready to hear what I got to say. I'm going to tell you a real important story. She strode to the classroom door and turned the latch with a thunk. Up until then, I had no idea the room could even be locked. I hazarded a, a glance at Julie, and my best friend. She was just as nonplussed. Boy, this must be some story she's got up her sleeve. Miss Boyd planted herself in front of the desk, arms bent and ending in bald fists. Pay attention now. I'm gonna to explain to you about why you are the way you are, why you're all crippled up. What? Was there such a thing as a group diagnosis? I looked, none of the teaching assistants were in the room. The substitute must have sent them away before class began. This did not strike me as a good omen. Now, I know you all been to the doctor and he said you got diseases and conditions and whatnot, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I bet none of you ever been told why you are the way you are. Why ain't none of you can walk worth a lick or talk right or take care of yourselves better than a dang baby. It's because each and every single one of you is the wages of sin. Your mama and your daddy were drinkers and smokers and thieves. I know this for the Lord Jesus' truth. Her voice sang song and rose and rose as enthusiasm ran roughshod over her grammar. It's obvious. He done punished you parents by making you all crippled up and drooling and making duty in your pants. From Nancy and Darlene and Larry and Debbie and Donald and Henry and Patty and Marianne and Shirley and from all of us poured a river of snot and rage. Somebody in the back of the room moaned, no, no. We were fifth graders, but this woman had reduced us to traumatized infants. I was baffled. How could she know anything of our parents? My mother and father weren't drinkers or thieves and not even Rabbi Indish was always so, so sorry for me, had ever said that I was handicapped because my parents were bad people. Miss Boyd pitched her voice above the, rhyming, above the rising din. You parents are fornicators with people they ain't even married to, fornicating with the devil himself, and you are the wages of sin. Jesus wants to make sure that everybody can tell that you be the child children of sinners. Her cheeks were shiny with muscular righteousness. I couldn't believe no one was pounding down the door. Julie clutched my wrist under the desk. She cut her eyes at me and then towards the hall and I understood. We could run for help. Anyone in a chair or on crutches would be caught halfway to the door. I wiped my mouth and I wiped my face and mouthed, let's go. As soon as Miss Boyd's head was turned, we dashed for the door. Julie snaked a long arm and twisted the iron knock, lock. Miss Boyd yelled, where do you two think you're going? But by then we were halfway down the stairs on our way to the principal's office. We burst past his shock secretary straight to the inner office and babbled over each other until he held up a stop sign hand. Girls, calm down. Mr. Hofter rose to his stack of giraffes height and said, 
show me. At the door of the classroom, he said, shh, be very quiet. I want to hear. We eavesdropped for maybe one whole minute before Mr. Hofter stepped inside, wrapped his fingers around her white cotton collar and lifted her clear out of her seat. That'll be quite enough. He marionetted her down the hall and that was the last we saw of our substitute teacher. Back in class, no one met each other's eyes. Eventually, the secretary told us that the buses were coming to take us home early, but no one came to talk to us. Not the school nurse, not the psychologist. No one ever did. As soon as I got home and saw mom, I fell to pieces. Condon would never be safe again. Something I had no words for had been lost. Mom sat me down at the kitchen table with hot cocoa and cookies and listened as I hiccuped through an entire box of Kleenex. I blew my nose and waited for her reaction. My warrior, my street fighter, pillar of justice mother would burn down the school with her fury. She shoved back her chair with a peppery snort and said but a single word, glam. Wonderful. It's wonderful and, and beautifully paced. This is the moment to ask you questions because I'm hogging you, and making you do a wonderful book. It's addictive, and as you read it, you want to read it again. I have to tell you. I hear and obey. Thank you, Reva. It's a great pleasure. I would like uh, during questions if we can show some of my work so people have an idea of what I do. Yes. But nice. we're, we are at Q&A, did you say? Yes, you thank you. Best? Thank you very much, Julia and Reva. And thank you for reading from your book. That was beautiful. So if people can send in their questions on chat, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, you can send them in from now. But I wondered if we could start by, um, asking you, Reva, about the use of the word crip in your book. Uh, you, you say that you're, you're reclaiming this word cripple that um, is shortened to crip and, and that that was very significant and important that you and other people in your community, in the disabled artist community, uh, did that. So could you talk a bit about the importance of reclaiming the language in that way? Well, it certainly wasn't a word that I had heard, on, I mean, as a reclaimed word. Um, probably not at all. I probably would have just heard cripple most of my life. Um, there's a story in the book where I, so after I left Condon School, I was completely gone from disabled community at all. Um, as you get older, well, as at the time, as one got older and started to uh, enter puberty and adolescence and teenage years, um, Condon went through eighth grade. So at that point, you're, you're pretty much in, you know, the, the early years of teenagerhood. And so by then I'd really gotten the message from the outside world that it was shameful to be disabled. So as soon as I left Condon, I stopped dealing with it. I wouldn't talk about it. I avoided other disabled people all the way up until my late thirties. And then when I was 30, uh, six or something, um, I was invited to join this thing called the uh, Chicago Disability Arts Collective which I didn't want to do. I got kind of bullied into it. And it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, these were some of the founders of disability culture in America. Um, some really important people. I had no clue. And they taught me resistant language. And the word that really stuck with me first was crip. Uh, Queer hadn't really come up yet. I mean, I was, I am queer, but at the time I called myself a lesbian, which I 
I do still on and off. Um, I'm more comfortable with queer because I feel like it encompasses more of just feeling outside. But that hadn't happened yet um, in, in uh, Chicago, to my knowledge. So reclaimed words were kind of, I guess a little bit, a little bit. I wasn't using it yet, I think. Um, so reclaimed language was something I was more familiar with from uh, black culture. And people explained that crip was the word that uh, cultural progressives, political progressives were using as a term of um, we're not hiding and it suited me so well. Um, there's still a lot of disabled people who are very uncomfortable with it as there are uh, LGBT people who are uncomfortable with queer. I leave it entirely up to people's discretion. I would never insist that anyone use language that didn't feel right to them. Um, and if someone is writing about someone in third person, I always say you have to check with the person. In the same way now that we check with pronouns, it's the same thing. Ask what you want to be called. There are people who are comfortable with, for me, horrendous terms like differently abled, um, handicapable. It's like ipecac. Um, but it's their prerogative to be called what they want. But I find those to be um, mealy mouthed. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions coming in actually from the audience. So let's go to some of our audience now. If we can go to Philippa Ackerman. Danielle, can you bring up Philippa Ackerman? And Philippa, if you could ask your question, please. To um, thank you for writing the exceptionally unusual book, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and for your artwork. Um, but when I was reading the book, I kept thinking, well, who, who is Reva intending this? book four, she's not put any glossary of terms or, or, so is it only for a Jewish audience that you intended it or do you want the wider audience to read it but aren't worried whether they understand the Yiddish and the Hebrew and the holiday terms and that sort of thing? We live in Google land, that's what I felt. <laughs> I spend a lot of time looking up words in other books and I felt like, you know, when there was something that I thought needed to be immediately explained or it would bring everything crashing, there are footnotes. Um, there are a lot of footnotes in the book, but for the most, but mainly it's that when you grow up in a bilingual family or you are bilingual or multilingual, you don't think, oh, I've just used a word from another language in my thought. You know, when you're talking or you're thinking, it's just who you are. It's just all these things flowing together. And when you, I wouldn't even let them italicize because I didn't want to drop um, that sense of, oh, we're in another language. I wanted it to be, this is the way I think, this is the way I talk. And if you have to spend a minute on Google, well, sei gesund, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Philippa. We've got a question from Eve Klein. Eve, are you okay to ask your question now to Reva? You can bring up Eve Klein. Hello, Eve. Hi, Eve. Un unmute. Oh, oh. Reva's oh. mute. Am I, am I, can you hear me? Now, you, now you're good. Can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, I would like to thank you because I'm your contemporary, but I also have a daughter of 35 who is an adult spina bif. And as I was reading it, um, it was I like encompassed your mother at times. And then I saw my daughter into you. And it was very, very insightful. So I would like to thank you for that. You, there's a couple of questions. Do you see yourself as a role model at all? You know, whether it's for the disabled or for the artists or or it, are you, do you have a multi-persona? I see myself as a doorway. I think whatever success I have, 
um, hopefully opens the door to someone who's reluctant to take on related material, whatever it is. I mean, when I first saw all the way through art school, I was told um, not to do images of people with uh, impairments and for years afterwards. And it wasn't until I saw uh, Frida Kahlo at a huge retrospective, her first in America, that I got an idea of how it might be handled. I don't know that I would call Frida a role model. I think she, I'm not sure how she would have taken that, but no, I just think that um, if something that I do goes well or gets attention, I want it to clear space for the next person um, who wants to do something like that. Thank you very much for that. Reva, we're getting loads of requests for your art. Could you show us some of your art, please? Sure. Um, did Eva have another quote? I, anyway. Oh, I, sorry. I, yes, Eve. did you, was there something else you wanted to ask um, before we yeah, leave you? No, that will be okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Okie doke. Um, let me try and do a spot of screen sharing here. By the way, I'm so jealous of you guys. You have the wonderful term. So I have an eyelash in my eye. It's driving me bonkers. Um, you have the great term Biffy in England, I've been told, for someone with spina bifida. And I've tried to get it to catch on here. I'm having no luck. But, you know, I think it's fabulous. Okay, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of click through uh, a quick slideshow. If there is one that you particularly want me to talk about um, in chat, uh, let me know. But I'm just going to um, go forward. Uh, Self-portrait, 66 degrees. Um, so the paintings are in acrylic. Sorry, can you, I think the mic got a little far away. Hopefully you can hear me better. So their paintings and drawings um, span 20 plus years of work. So recent self-portrait 66 degrees. Recent portrait of uh, Cuban novelist Achio. Can you guys see this? Is it? No. Is there, oh, no. shoot. All right, let's try that again. Sorry about that. Okay, now can you see it? Can yeah. you see? Yes. Okay, let's go back. Sorry. Okay, that's the cover of the book. If you could push on full um, screen, if you put your yes, screen. absolutely. We good now? Yes, that's great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Sixty-six degrees. Recent painting, self-portrait on acrylic. Achio Bejas, this is Cuban queer Cuban novelist Achio Bejas. Uh, the whole thing goes together. The vitrine is, is part of the drawing. Um, this is as I'm working over Zoom right now, um, trying to figure out how to be a portrait artist when I can't have anyone in my studio. And when you read the book, you'll understand just how bad a situation that is. Because most all my work is based on ethics. So trying to figure out how to handle ethics over Zoom is um, something. But this, she's very, Alice Wong, uh, extremely famous disability activist. She posed for me over Zoom. Uh, also, speaking of people who are quite well known, this is Alison Bechdel, graphic novelist who uh, wrote Fun Home and Are You My Mother? And has a new book coming out finally. Um, uh, this is a mixed media drawing with partial dimensional. Uh, a lot of the drawings are partly dimensional. This is Deborah Broad um, from a series called Totems and Familiars. So for instance, this is dimensional, it's real threads, all of this is dimensional. I'm gonna collapse this, yeah, there we go. If you can't see, you can collapse your, um, uh, the pictures of people so you can see the full screen. This is my brother and my nephew. My nephew is disabled, this is uh, Doug and Nathan Lair from about 12 years ago. This is another self-portrait from about the same period. 
uh, Edgewater Beach. As I mentioned, I work with a lot of genderqueer people. This is Finn Enke, who was undergoing gender transition as we were um, working together. This is a large drawing on a toned paper. Oh, this is someone you guys will know, I think. This is um, uh, Liz Carr um, from Silent Witness um, and many other shows. Um, she's a good friend. They're, I don't think that they included my portrait of Matt Frazier in the slideshow, but it's on my website. So that's acrylic on panel. This is Lynn Manning, um, a large two-part charcoal from uh, 2006. There's Braille up in this section, but it, you can't really see it on the so slide. This is Mom, um, or the title is, is Mom. Um, when I was 41, uh, you'll understand the meaning of this painting when you, if you read the book. This is Will Fugo. Actually, oh, unfortunately, they don't have the one with, they don't have the vitrine included, but this is somebody who's in the book and I believe on our chat right now. <laughs> Hi, Will. Um, my first uh, boyfriend from college who sat for me last year, right before the pandemic hit. And lastly, this is a self-portrait that is hanging right over there, over my couch. Um, this is the dog from the, the book, this is Zora, who went blind um, when she was eight. So for half her life, she was my service dog. And for half her life, I was her service human. And that's a very large mixed media piece on Mylar. Um, so anyway, almost life-size. So that is, that's my work some of it and now I'm going to try and get us back. Why is this? How do I go back to, okay, stop screen share. That'll do it. Hi again. Thank you. Th thanks, Reva. As you can see, if you haven't got, or if you haven't seen the book, the paintings and drawings are incredibly powerful. Um, the wonderful, wonderful pieces of work. Um, we've got lots more questions, so. It's all over the book. There's some, uh, dozens, there's like 60, 60 yes. images. Yeah, and that's one of the, the lovely and unusual things about the book, it's filled with your, your artwork. Um, so it, it makes it come even more alive than the prose does, it's, they're, they're wonderful. <laughs> okay. It's coming for you, it's coming for you. <laughs> Let's go to Selena Gellert. Uh, Selena, you've got a question for Reva. Yes. Hi, Reva. I was really fascinated by your book. Um, I'm a retired family doctor, so obviously it, it meant a lot to me. Uh, but I was also very upset by some of the medical events and the interactions that happened to you and to your mother. Um, and I wondered whether you thought the medical profession had improved at all uh, and how you felt that some of these not so great experiences and events affected you, if you feel you could talk about this. Well, I do think medicine has uh, improved. I think it's still got a way to go. Um, I think that the move towards uh, patient involvement has been major sometimes it's been a little too much where the decisions are so left up to the patient who is never going to have the amount of information the doctor does that it also gets entangled up with uh, malpractice and insurance rates and stuff um but you know for every reaction there's an equal and opposite reaction so i think we're in this land of like okay we were treating them this way now we're going to try and treat them that way and eventually there'll be some kind of parody that gets figured out i think um how it affected me read the book there's 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 a lot of ways it affected me um but part of it is that i teach now in medical humanities and i'm i'm on leave right now because I can't go into the cadaver lab with COVID going on, but actually tomorrow I get to go and visit 
uh, my colleague in the cadaver lab because I'm writing a new book and part of it takes place in the cadaver lab. So I'm very excited about going back and seeing the, the smelly old stomping grounds. So what do you think? Do you think things have gotten better? I do. I do. I like to think so. I was involved in education, in teaching medical students and in teaching people training to be family doctors in this country. And I like to think that we have improved things somewhat. Yes, <laughs> I like to think so. I hope so. Well, one funny aside is that after the book came out, I've now heard from two of my childhood doctors. And that's been... That's been amazing um, to, anyway, that's a very long story, but I'm talking to people who operated on me 40 something years ago. So something, but thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Reva. What's your next book about, Reva? Can you tell us anything? Can you give us, no? It's fiction, it's fiction and, and I hope I get to write it because I keep getting interrupted. Uh, it's, it's going back into the memoir actually, but fictionally trying to, um, trying to deal with themes of grieving. Um, but it's, I don't think it's going to be a sad book, but I think it's about wrestling with, uh, with grief. So anyway, that's as much as I can say. Okay. I think lots of us will be looking out for that. We've got a question from Grace. Uh, Grace Vincent, can we? Hi, Grace. Go over Hi, to Grace. Um, I loved your readings, just to say. You're Thank a you. brilliant, brilliant reader. Where are um, you, Grace? I want to see you. Oh, sorry. Yes, this is Grace I'm... from Virago. So let's all have a round of applause for Virago. Yay. I'm not looking very camera ready today. Um, but I just wanted to ask, you mentioned how you're adapting um, to Zoom life during the pandemic. Um, but could you... Tell us a bit about how you got into being a portrait artist um, and then the challenge is what, how it's working now. I'd love to hear more. Well, um, I always painted the figure. There's a difference between a figure painting and a portrait and people get very confused by it. But what a portrait is in general, it's an image that is about the importance of one or more individuals. So it's the story of that individual and generally they're identified and that is versus something where the artist wants to tell a story and brings in models to stand in for those characters. So religious paintings, mythological paintings, um, uh, political works, anything, you know, dreams, um, they might be just as technically rendered as a portrait. So it might look exactly like the model, but it's not about the model. The model is being an actor um, in another story. So my first works were figure works where I was trying to figure out how to talk about, um, uh, it was a mix. Um, but I got such criticism for trying. Uh, I still get people still get people who tell me I shouldn't be dealing with disability in my work still. And some of them are close friends and it's like, what, 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 what should I do? I, I used to do pet portraits. Like, do you want me to go back to pet portraits? I don't think anyway. Um, but it was really when there, there were a lot of steps. It started with self portraits and one in particular that's in the book. But when I met the people at the Disability Arts uh, Collective in 1997, I started to change what I thought was beautiful. And for years I've been evolving a sense of beauty um, that's true, it's not, it's not a political stance. I'm moved and entranced by all of the ways that a person, that the human body, that a human can, can ah, the shape of, human, of humanity, all the different expressions of the shapes of humanity, particularly when, uh, when it's a body that is not suited to 
the built world or the societal world and it still constructs a life and a self there's a way that um people who are looked at all the time who are always judged and scrutinized they on one hand become very self-conscious uh, often very performative because disability and queerness are both very performative in that you're always having to like manage it in society in ways that are not easy but it's also ends up where those people often develop a kind of super presence that I can see. Their bodies aren't um, ciphers or numb. I think for a lot of people who are able-bodied, their bodies are just kind of these invisible-ish vehicles that they move around in. I mean, I know how it feels because when I'm really, really healthy, I forget my body. I like, it's okay, it's hungry, it needs to sleep, whatever. But it's not a challenge. It's not a question in those moments. Um, and I think that's more or less what it's like for people who are continue long stretches of being able-bodied, that their bodies have their demands, but it's not um, uh, being slammed against the world all the time. And if you are, I think that you just, you develop a way that you are in your body. You are aware of it. You know what it looks like, you know how, moves, you know, what people think of it, you know, how you want to manage it in public. And there's just something, I can just see it. I just see it. And that's what really snags me. And it's not just about being disabled. There's, there's a lot of versions, but for me, that's what really is beauty to me these days. So it took a long time to kind of evolve that. And the first portraits I did were, were attempts. They're not very good, but that's my, um, that's my purpose pretty much as an artist is to find that. And now I'm having to find it over Zoom. Yay. <laughs> Hopefully not for too much longer. Okay. Thank you, Reva. We've got one more question. Can we stretch to one more question? Okay. Um, We've just got a few more minutes left. Is that okay, Reva? Sure, I'm here. Okay, so if we can go to Mike Wolfman, who's asking about the various influences on your work. Uh, have we got Mike? Literary or artistic, I assume artistic? Uh, artistic. If Mike uh, doesn't... Hi. Oh, here, here is Mike. Yeah, sorry, my camera isn't working, so I can't... Uh, <laughs> I can't, you can't see That's me. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question uh, was actually um, about some of your work, which um, when you were flashing it up there on the uh, on the Zoom, uh, reminded me of of some of sort of the style of Paula Rego, oh, and I was wondering if if Paula Rego was some sort of influence because uh, some of your some of your work certainly reminded me of that. I love her. Um, I have a lot of influences. I actually got to zip up her dress once. She was, oh. she was in the ladies room of the uh, Art Institute before giving a wonderful talk. And it's one of those things where, you know, you're, you're pulling yourself together and you, you can't quite reach the top of the zipper. <laughs> so I, I got to do the last three inches and I felt so honored. <laughs> um, that must have been a very exciting moment for you. It really was. <laughs> she's, she's such a hero to me, my God. Um, but I, you know, uh, her, there's a painter that I studied with, that I talk about in the book named Bailey Dugan, who's tragically under, under recognized, um, extremely brilliant painter. There's, uh, I mean, there are class, there Northern Renaissance, um, a lot. Uh, these days, I'm really looking mostly at painters who are handling, um, who are addressing black culture. I think that this, some of the strongest figuration is coming out of uh, the community of black painters who are doing just searingly brilliant figuration. Um, I'm trying to kind of rethink my approach to a lot of things. Um, but, you know, 
I'm 63, I've seen a lot of painting. And there are a lot of painters I love, but mainly it's painters who take on what I think of as something real. My, my question about being an artist is, is the work you're doing worth, worth your life? You know, is this what you're going to do with your life? And if you, you can answer that, much of yourself in it. it takes everything from you. So it had better be what you think your life is about. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Reva. And thank you, Julia. Thank you both. It's been a really wonderful chance to hear more about Golem Girl and the influences and the background to the book. I strongly encourage you, if you haven't read it, to read it. It's beautiful, profound, and powerful, and certainly one of the more unusual books I've ever read. And uh, it's been wonderful hearing more about it tonight. So thank you. Thank you to our audience. Please join us again. We'll be visiting Cultural Prague in our next uh, online event on the 21st of March. And if you go to the website and look under events, you can find out how to join us then. We'll be joined by the novelist Shalom Auslander and various other people from the Prague community and hear about the history and culture of Jewish Prague and uh, meet the community who are living and working there today. Yes, Reva, join us too. We you to yeah, you're going to invite me, right? Prague, Golems, Shalom Auslander. I, I, yeah. The golem lives on. Yeah. Oh. On the 21st of March. We hope to see Reva and everybody there. So thank you very much. Well, I want to say thank you to Julia, who wrote a wonderful piece, has been so supportive and kind and sweet, and to everybody at JR and a huge, giant, squishy squish to Virago. So from a biffy in America to England. Y'all stay safe. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everybody.